Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you so much, uh, Provost Melitius, and thank you for being here on a Monday afternoon. Um, it's a real thrill for me to share this work with you today, and it's been a long time coming. I've been working on this stuff for 10 years, and it's been nice since I deposited in January to take a break from it and come back to it and share it with you today. But before I go on, I do want to make a small announcement. Um, some of you may have heard, some of you may, have, you may not heard, uh, that we lost a dear colleague over the last week, and I'd like to dedicate today's lecture to the memory of my friend, Mark Natangana, who taught history, was uh, an African musician who played with, with Paul Simon. I got to play with him a couple of times. And he and I and Michael Namphy and Forrest Cope and George White had the pleasure and honor to do this sort of colloquium on music. And last two years, we did one on Michael Jackson and one on Steve, uh, uh, Stevie Wonder. And they were always a, a hoot. <laughs> and so, Martin, you're no longer with us, but you're in my heart, and uh, he will be missed. I, uh, the uh, viewing and funeral are this weekend. Uh, if you'd like the information, I'll give it to you. But, so this is for Martin today, and for you. It's, it's, I, I, I can't believe you're all here. I know some of you have class now and have to be here, but that's all right, <laughs> that's all right. Um, and I wanna thank all the professors for bringing their classes. You didn't have to do that. And um, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. I have about an hour's worth of material for you, and I'm gonna sort of oscillate between talking at you and reading at you. Uh, I just returned from Canada yesterday. I was at the Guelph Jazz Festival. Uh, I gave a presentation called Widening the Spectrum, uh, Expanding the Scope of Taught Musical Improvisation, and I talked about the York College Creative Ensemble. We have some members of the ensemble in here. And I'm sort of in, in presentation mode, so this feels very natural because I wasn't in a classroom last week because of all the holidays. So I'm gonna give you, give you my best. I'm not going to try to, I'm going to try not to make you go to sleep. I hear there are snacks later, but you can't leave the room until we are done. So um, here we go. Uh, to open up, I, there is a quote that I stumbled across. Come on, come on in. Don't be shy. Rip it off like a Band-Aid. <laughs> Stay as long as you can. Um, the Austrian Cultural Forum, which is an institution that is located on 52nd Street here in New York, has brought Austrian culture to New York City since the late 50s. And in, since the 80s, they've had a jazz component. And at the 2007 Jazz Festival, which was called the Mostly Jazz Festival, the curator, Helga Hinterer, said, no boundaries seems to be the unspoken motto of musicians in Vienna. And this is sort of something that plagued, literally plagued my research. I started looking seriously at, at jazz and improvised music in 2002 and spent a decade looking at this stuff. And there are reasons why it took forever. Um, one of the reasons is I was working here at York College and couldn't devote all my time to it. But when I did, I. I it was very difficult, and I'm going to explain why. Because today is an opportunity to tell you why did it take a decade to write this work, if you will. It was some work. Um, but but I've got to contextualize everything. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense. Um, I was born in this country. Um, my father was economics professor for a long, long time. And we lived wherever he was working. I was mostly in the South for a while. But in 1985, we moved to Austria. He is Austrian, and he moved there for work. and so. I was in Austria for high school. Uh, I speak German, and my parents still live there. Now, this created a situation where being bilingual, bicultural, whatever you want to think of it as, uh, gave me a perspective on this music that I thought was helpful. Little did I know that it would be more difficult looking at something that's familiar than something that is, that is unfamiliar. Um, and, and in this way, looking at jazz and improvised music in Vienna, I'm looking at two familiar things. I'm looking at my familiar home and my familiar music. I, as, as Tim pointed out, I went to Grinnell College, which is in Iowa. I, I came here to New York in 2000. I've played professionally both in the Twin Cities in Minnesota and here in New York. And so this topic of jazz and improvised music seemed like a natural one. And I started attending performances here 
in New York of Austrians at the Austrian Cultural Forum and other clubs, and I spent about, in total, four months doing research in Austria uh, over about 10 trips. I would go there two and three weeks at a time. I'd rent a base. I'd jam with musicians, shake some hands, jam with mostly Austrians, but also there were some expatriates who live in Austria and in Vienna. Now, so the methodology behind what I was trying to do was try to get a grasp on this city that is known more for Sigmund Freud, Mozart, and pastries than for jazz and improvised music. When you think of Austria, jazz is not the first thing you think of. But jazz has been in Austria since the beginning of jazz. There have been musicians since the 1920s making jazz in Vienna and in Austria. In fact, the first school on jazz was founded in Salzburg in 1965. So Austria, even though it, it might be not the first thing you think of, jazz has a long tradition in Austria. As, as, and you could argue it's as long as it is. It's about 100 years old, like it is here. Um, so I would meet all these musicians. And because there is such a tradition of live music in Vienna, I mean, it's, it's the toast of Europe in many ways, still is. And, and Austria, don't forget, it's, it's, it's an old, old, old culture, um, not old. I mean, old is a relative term when we look at Africa, when we look at Asia, but music making in Austria has is, 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 is gone on for a very long time, and Austria as a civilization is, is very old. But the problem is, is the country itself has changed several times. If you know your history, uh, the first time we hear something that may become the term Austria, or what, what the term Austria means, it, it, it comes from something in, in high German called Österreichie and it means the eastern region. This is 996 that this just sort of region of land and people was, was, was cobbled together. And over time, you may have heard the Habsburg Empire and things like these, and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and these borders wax and wane. And then comes along the 20th century, where in 1914, we have the end of this great era, the Habsburg Empire, and Austria has shrunk down to a very tiny, tiny country. And then we cannot talk about Austria without talking about World War II and the Holocaust. These borders change over time. So one of the first things that came up in my research was what does it mean to be Austrian? And at the same time, I was trying to understand what it meant to be jazz in Austria. So again, this sort of doubleness comes up again. What is Austrian identity over time? What is Austrian identity now? If, if we've had jazz in Austria since the 1920s, that means before, during, and after World War II. So nothing is a monolith. I couldn't be a good academic and monolithize things and say, this is Austrian jazz. But it got to the point where people would say, no, you can't even refer to an Austrian sound. The sound is so freakishly eclectic that it, it, it really, I couldn't get my head around it. I couldn't get my hand on it, even though it was familiar, the culture, the language, the people. The type of music that is existing in Austria that is under the umbrella of jazz and improvised music is, is very confusing. And so trying to stitch it all together began to be impossible, if you will. But I also need to say that jazz is not enough, and I'll talk about that in a moment. There's a reason that, that my work is entitled Jazz and Improvised Music. So um, in the 1960s, maybe even as early as the 1950s, we have an emancipation of jazz in all of Europe. From the 1920s about to the 1950s, you have basically a carbon copy of what jazz is in the US in Europe. Right? They have people that are sounding like Louis Armstrong. They have people that are sounding like Duke Ellington, et cetera, et cetera, playing bebop. And because of the Cold War and other issues, we have a splitting away, a, a, away from the uh, uh, Euro, sorry, U.S. American model early in some places, like Eastern Europe, Russia, even England. Um, but in Austria, because of its neutrality, because it is this sort of bastion of, of neither east nor west, because during the Cold War, it and Sw Switzerland tried to remain neutral, it is, its evolution is stunted. So it, it stays in this very strange, not resisting a, a US model, not a conscious break, but it happens so slowly over time. And given who is making this music, 
when it finally catches up, it's not a big division like in other places. So I'm just trying to give you a little bit of an overview of where I'm going to go with all this information. And I'm trying to convey in this hour we have together, hour and a half we have together, the spirit of this work. And it took me 10 years to put it together, and, and, and it was published this year as a book. And I've got an hour to sort of explain it to you. So I'm just going to try to hit some points. I'm going to talk at you. Hopefully we'll have some time for some music because it's ethnomusicologists are often made fun of because there's no music in ethnomusicology. See how I did that? Um, we tend to, to talk about music much more than make it and, and listen to it. Now, what is an ethnomusicologist? That's someone who's basically an anthropologist who likes to talk about music, who likes to be with musicians. So I cannot look at music outside of its culture. I need to see it firmly planted in the people who are making it. Um, so let's, 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 let's think about what it means when we say jazz. And I bet I could ask you for a definition for everyone in the room, and we'd all get slightly different ideas what jazz is, what jazz isn't. And like so many things in anthropology, it's a social construct. And there, there is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Like so many things, like gender, like race, like class, like citizenship, like good food and bad food, it's all agreed upon socially. So what is jazz in this country has been debated as long as jazz has existed. People like Max Roach, Duke Ellington, Charles Mingus didn't like the term and used alternate terms like great black music uh, or American classical music. And these terms cause more problems than, 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 than are solved. So instead of sort of dragging out the debate of what is and isn't jazz in this country, you can read all about it in my dissertation. You can Google it tonight. You have your conservatives, your liberals, you know, and you know, fusion, that rock-oriented music is not jazz, it's rock and roll. That's, that's already one debate. But if you can imagine that as a one messy debate, there's an even messier debate in Austria that sort of is a manifestation of the rampant eclecticism in Austrian jazz and improvised music. Now, I, I did a lot of interviews with musicians, I, I, and I, I recorded maybe over 100 hours of sitting down and conducting formal interviews. And I, I did interviews in Vienna, I did interviews here in New York, and I, I tried to coalesce sort of some of the, these major ideas in there, but because it's so eclectic, it was really hard to tease out any real trend. To talk about trends in Austrian jazz and improvised music is, is almost ridiculous. And that's why in my dissertation I talk about, in quotes, academics love their quotes, typical jazz. And I'll talk about three strains and, and how they've developed over time. But I need to share some of this stuff with you just so you get an idea and, and also so I can incorporate some of the voices of the people I spoke with. Now, you know, if you're not going to read from your own book at the provost lecture, <laughs> when are you going to read from your own book? I think it's highly egotistical, but I don't care. <laughs> and, and, and so I'm going to read from my book. And I, and one of the favorite things is, I don't have to write my name on it. It's already on there. But anyway. Uh, but I also didn't want to kill some trees just for stuff that is already in here. But so here are some of, of, of these definitions that I came up uh, against. The most apparent difference between jazz performance and definition between the United States and Austria is the absence of arguments around authenticity. For many Austrians, jazz is seen simply as a touchstone or departure port. What is interesting about jazz to most Austrians is what comes next. The idea of jazz as departure point can be seen as a trend and manifests itself in many places. For example, on the sign outside Vienna's most important jazz and improvised music venue, Porgy and Bess, is the phrase, quote, jazz and music club. The slogan for what was one of the better jazz record stores in Vienna read Octopus, interestingly named after the 1975 Jefferson Starship album of the same name, was the phrase record store for jazz and more. A series of jazz concerts geared toward younger audiences by a company called Junis is entitled Jazz and Beyond. Another small but important venue in, in Vienna, Miles Smiles, includes the phrase jazz and more strange and beautiful music 
on all of its posters and flyers. But I believe the, most, the best sentiment is the name of the concert series held at the venue Sagfabrik, which translates as Coffin Factory, quote, simply more than jazz. But at the same time, the term jazz in recent years has been seen as a liability. In the Falta article, Wir wollen ein Haus, We Need a Home, which discusses the recent rapid change in governmental and public financial support for jazz and improvised music in Vienna, young genre-bending bassist Lukas Kanzelbinder urges jazz-rooted musicians to branch out and possibly divorce themselves from the, from the term. Quote, the jazz scene is cooking in Vienna. There is a feeling of total departure, but the feeling does not want to have anything more to do with the term jazz. Looking at the behavior of audiences, jazz is dead. One gains no new audiences with it when someone says jazz. Young people will not attend. As mentioned in my introduction, there is a, cer a certain awkwardness surrounding the term jazz in Vienna, which is evident with my interviews with musicians in casual conversations with musicians and others during my first research trip to Vienna in 2008, I asked if one could speak of an Austrian jazz or a Viennese jazz stylistically, and the answer was usually immediately, no. During my formal interviews in 2009 and 11, I asked several musicians whose music included elements, markers, and instrumentation that would easily be recognized as jazz by U US audiences, and who were also improvisers, if they considered themselves jazz musicians. Their answers were telling of how jazz is performed in Austria. Of the 27 musicians performing and living in Vienna that I formally interviewed or sent a questionnaire via email to, only two of them considered themselves jazz musicians without question. Interestingly, both musicians are US American expatriates. Six of the musicians that I questioned firmly rejected the label of jazz musician but qualified their answers with statements explaining either that jazz was a departure point or that they did not divide music up into genres. For example, Hans Heiss talked about jazz as a literal vehicle that allowed him to develop his own style. Quote, jazz was this rental car, so to speak, that I always borrowed for my rhythmic feel, for my improvisation feel, and for a wider understanding. But Thomas Gansch found the term limiting and explained that he did not group music into genres, echoing a very Ellingtonian sentiment. I consider myself to be an all-round musician. I do not think in categories. For me, there is no such thing as jazz, classical, folk, or pop music. For me, there's just music out there, all worth to be played as well as possible and live. There are only two types of music, good and bad, which is a quote by Ellington. And Max Nagel completely rejected the idea of jazz and stated, I consider myself a musician. These musicians all see themselves as borrowers of elements from a tradition they are not necessarily a part of, or as inhabitants of a tradition that may include elements of jazz, which they may or may not use. But the non-committal, gray area between yes and no was the most common answer among jazz and improvising musicians in Vienna as to whether they identified as jazz musicians or not. In German, the word jein, a fusion of ja, yes, and nein, no, is used to mean literally yes and no. In some shape or form, jein was the most common answer to my question. When asked if they considered themselves jazz musicians, 19 different musicians in Vienna answered with various versions of a little, but not only, only a part, or maybe not. Franz Obertado was confused after he thought about the question and answered, I have no idea but I'm interested in many things that come from jazz, maybe? Daniel Riegler's solution is something to avoid answering, uh, is sometimes to avoid answering the question, explaining that it depends whom I'm talking to. If somebody was a narrow, has a narrow definition of jazz, I'd rather stay outside this field to avoid discussions. A musical style is nothing to discuss about or to fight over. It is not important to me what I, I am considering myself in terms of musical style. In addition to avoiding being boxed in by others, place and location can even change one's personal classification as a jazz musician. Martin Philadelphi stated that his identification as a jazz musician depended on which side of the Atlantic he was on and how he was marketing himself. When in Vienna, he was not a jazz musician, but when in New York, he was. 
To illustrate further this departure from the jazz tradition and to put this in a transatlantic perspective, Austrian pianist Oskar Eichinger explained the importance of improvisation as it is performed in Austria and the lack of the need of jazz standards to do so. Quote, I assume that what touches people in jazz is improvisation, i.e. the renunciation of the subject. At least this is what I always felt as a listener. In a composition, it should only work as a kind of spark plug in the explosive mix of subjects, which ultimately sets the engine running. At the end of the day, improvising about jazz standards is the same thing, but for me, it has become obsolete for historical, formal, and personal reasons. I am not a New Yorker. I dream of a music which is wholly committed to art and its complex mystery, but still graspable, simple, and sophisticated at the same time, like a good joke. The practice of performing the same songs over and over again is mundane and un uninteresting to Eichinger. As a non-New Yorker, he does not feel bound to this tradition. Eichinger is more interested in a wider range of the improvisational potential of music, and he is not alone in this lack of a fascination of improvisation over repeated harmonies. In order to understand how the idea of jazz is perceived, I asked people in jazz and improvised music scene in Vienna to define jazz and explain the music that they made. The resulting responses fell into two groups, more technical answers and more emotive poetic answers. Regarding the technical, many musicians spoke of the qualities and attributes when defining jazz. For example, trombonist, composer, and founding member of the eclectic young musicians collective Jazz Werkstatt, Wien, which means Jazz Factory Vienna. Daniel Riegler defined jazz specifically as a, quote, combination of composed and improvised music, groove possible, pulse almost ever, rooted in black American music, meanwhile, global musical language. Riegler's definition of jazz includes the typical roots and attributes, but listening to Riegler's recordings, it is clear that he does not limit himself to this definition. <laughs> Riegler uses elements of jazz, like its instrumentation, but also incorporates electronics, chamber music elements, and other non-traditionally jazz elements. From the music some and, uh, jazz and improvising musicians were making were dis was discussed, further attributes and sources were immediately revealed. Trumpeter Thomas Berghammer, who is more aligned with the more freely improvised music scene in Vienna and also a member of the klezmer group Nifties, described his own music as, quote, a combination of new music improvisation and free jazz, coming from mainstream jazz with always a strong interest in avant-garde jazz, plus searching for the experiments with uncommon, untypical trumpet sounds. Another and very important aspect is African music and having, possibly to, having the possibility to play in different styles but be centered in a field which is wide and where I have a lot of freedom for my interpretations. The sources are very eclectic but very specific. Bassist Klaus Sinovats, who is very loosely tied with, the, with a textbook definition of jazz, draws more from free improvisation, was also quite specific when describing non-jazz elements of his music. I would classify my music between the poles of free improvised music in the art of free jazz in the style of Art Ensemble of Chicago and the songwriting in German language in the art of Brecht and Weil. Trumpeter Franz Kogelmann also saw this music as a continuum, but very specifically an intersection, a quote, music between the lines, music at the intercept point of jazz and European modern. Finally, drummer Wolfgang Reisinger who is a longtime member of the Vienna Art Orchestra, which I'll talk about in a moment, gave the longest answer. I would like to find one word that describes what music I do. For sure, it is multi-influenced. I come from the European classical tradition. That was my first musical love, Mozart, Schubert, Beethoven. And then I heard Coltrane's My Favorite Things, and soon after that, Miles Davis's Bitches Brew. That changed my whole focus, groove and direct emotion. The third big experience, new music, Stockhausen, Habenstock, Romati, Xenakis, and many more of them musical scientists. And of course the ethnics on the other side, especially African and flamenco. I feel all that musics are different forms of the same need inside human beings, much like the different languages in the world that all serve the same purpose in different colors. The way it is done is not important. Composition, improvisation, meditation, or remixing, or whatever, just different cultural forms of the same thing. 
I would like to use all, that influ all these influences and form a personal view, bring together again what was separated in a free and natural way. Call it refusion, like my CD of the same name, for now, until I find a better term. I, initially I was initially shocked to find that none of these musicians felt an allegiance to U.S. American models. They all felt a freedom to incorporate other resources from other musics. There was no idea of jazz as a constant that must be maintained. Later, Reisinger said to me emphatically that, quote, there are no roots, implying that jazz and improvised music in Vienna are not tied down to a tradition. Jazz and improvised music in Vienna are perceived as a more open music, using other resources, some based in African-American traditions and markers, Austrians are not necessarily worried about or concerned with replicating these traditions and markers. Rather, they are interested in the mixture and addition of musics. Jazz alone is simply not interesting. Saxophonist Fritz Novotti criticized jazz as an old form of training. For many jazz and improvising musicians in Vienna, the idea of moving forward and beyond jazz is a given and expected. Guitarist and vocalist Martin Philadelphi began his response earlier using specific sources, but the description quickly breaks down, which he freely admits. Quote, the top styles of music for me are pop and improvised music. I like to experiment with both, influenced by rock, pop, African, mu African rhythms, blues, improvised music, classical music, and new music. I love to improvise, and at the same time, like to write songs and compose for film or theater. Music is my life. That is why it is hard for me to give a short answer about my music. It would be like if I gave you a short answer about my life. Philadelphia's initial answer evolves into a more emotive poetic response. These emotive poetic responses further highlight an interest in mixture and emphasis on openness. Thomas Kahn simply stated that, quote, jazz is music played with open ears, eyes, and mind. And Christoph Kurzmann broke his definition of jazz down into three parts. One, the music that has interested me most of my life. Two, intense improvised music. And three, depending on the time and place, a cry for liberation. Uli Soika elaborated similar ideas. Quote, for me personally, jazz is simply a wonderful world where I can express myself musically, improvisationally, interactively, soloistically. Unlimited musical possibility to communicate. I do not make any stylistic compromises. In my projects, the respective musicians' personalities are what count. The more experience someone has, the more exciting the musical dialogue, discussion, or expedition. Potentially, everyone could be taken together under the spell. Continuing the theme of musical community, Alex Lustig emphasizes a social process of jazz performance. Quote, jazz is a way of living, socializing, and working artistically in a special context. The context can be seen as a social, historical, or musical one. Jazz is a constant examination of tradition and room, to and room for maneuver. It means searching for reasons of the actual musical work, and if, even though sound and other event sounds and other means. These more emotive poet uh, poetic answers show that for many Austrians, jazz is a license to be open and explore possibilities. This openness and plural plurality interfaces well with Austrian culture and history. Given Austria's multicultural past and re renegotiation of identity over centuries. So that was a long, long excerpt. Um, but I want you to hear these multiple voices. And these multiple voices were very confusing. You know, when I, when I do jazz, <laughs> uh, wherever it is, whether it's in the classroom or in, in, in the Lower East Side or in Austria, you know, I, I'm functioning with a concept of, of what jazz is, that this, this greater community. And so a community that is based on diversity, on, on eclecticism, and it's one of the reasons I love teaching at York, at York College, is that I love the diverse community here, and it's very normal to me. And I didn't realize that until sort of backwards fell into it. But Vienna is a very diverse uh, place in many, many ways. And so York College just seems very compatible to me. I, I went to an American international school, and there were multiple languages and multiple foods and multiple attitudes. This is normal. But it really challenged my ideas of jazz, that, that, that as I came up as a trained jazz musician, first in Minnesota and now here in New York, I, there's this, sort of this jazzness that, that jazz musicians have. And 
it was very hard for me to exist in a space where other musicians didn't feel that, pursue it, re replicate, negotiate these ideas. Don't get me wrong, there are tons of forms of jazz here in New York City. There's swing, there's bebop, there's free, there's Brazilian jazz and things like that. But after a while, this fragmented scene of, you had electronics over here and then you had people who were just playing music that sounds like vacuum cleaners running and, 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 and it was all under one umbrella. It was all one um, under, under umbrellas that, that, and then it got very confusing and to try to stitch it together is, is, is I think that's one of the reasons this scene is underdocumented. When you look at any book of European jazz, you get Russia, you get Germany, you get England, you get Spain, you get all these other places, but Austria is continually absent from the discussion. And I think because of this plurality, this multiplicity, it's hard to hold on to. And even as a quote unquote insider, which I thought I was, you know, being a trained musician here in the US and having lived in Austria for six years, I thought I could at least put it together. But um, I could, there are a couple of more definitions in the book, but, but the long passage is, is, is taxing, I know. But there's one guy who said, I don't know. And it, it made me almost throw up my hands. You know, I, you don't know what jazz is and you're calling yourself a jazz musician or you're playing in these jazz clubs and how dare you? And, and I, I started seeing my own prejudice that, that, that jazz was this sort of space, that jazz was this process. And there is a lot of literature on, 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 on jazz as nation, jazz as ecology. And because I think like that, it was very hard for me to get around the idea of that not existing. That it was more like these CDs on this table up here, just sort of a collection of things, just no rhyme or reason, just, just here. And, and, and we're going to put a little sign over here that says jazz and improvised music. You know, I can hear connections between Ellington and, and, and Ornette Coleman, not just because of the instrumentation, but because of the attitude and what the music does. And for me, you know, I, I listened to, to hundreds, if not thousands of hours of this music, sat in clubs to get a feeling for it. And it, it, it's sometimes just jazz in name only. And this was frustrating to me as someone who's devoted their life to the music. Now here's, here's what's very interesting to me. There is a lot, or there at least used to be, a lot of economic support for jazz in Austria. Um, they're, they're, they have, unlike this country, they have things like uh, social uh, welfare. I mean, to a much larger degree, we have it here too, but not, not like in Europe. But they also have a support system of the arts. And to keep things very eclectic, there's a lot of money invested in these clubs and in these musicians and in their education and in their projects so that it's almost a supply side system. And this is one of the things that, that made me start to understand why the music work, worked or didn't work the way it was created because there was a lot of money for it. There's a lot of opportunity for it. Musicians are paid very well. I went over there and I worked and, and, I, and they gave me money and I was just like, wow, you know, I was, I, 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 I was used to empty rooms and paying my own cab fare home. That's what happens usually in, in New York, unless you play at Lincoln Center, unless you play at Carnegie Hall or you play these festivals. Most musicians in New York City do not make their living in New York. Most jazz musicians go to Europe and Asia to make their yearly salary and then come back here. And they try to string tours together and, and that is unfortunately changing. With the economic crisis of 2008 that spread around the globe, certain things um, are, are just not there. I, I look, the dates of, of my work is from 1971, which is coincidentally the year I was born, to 2011 for a reason. In 2010, one of the largest engines of, of Austrian jazz, the Vienna Art Orchestra, folded. It was established in 1977. They just could not continue to operate. Record stores have closed. Uh, these, these resources I was telling you about where students got scholarships, etc. That, the, the Hans Kohler Prize, which was a huge amount of money that was given to a musician every year, isn't happening anymore. So they are in for a real rude awakening going forward and it also kind of um, provided a nice arc for, for my work. Now, 
One of the reasons that it started in 1971, me looking at my work, is because of a, a uh, uh, I'm, I have some things to show you. I'm not just going to drone on at you. Um, and we will listen to music. This festival in a town named Osiach, and that's the cover of a record. It, this festival was a multicultural extravaganza of world music and jazz, and it was very unique. It was supposed to be the Woodstock of Corinthia. And they had everything from Joe Zavinal's Weather Report to Pink Floyd. They had some uh, musicians. Uh, they had Indian classical music. They had Romanian choirs and things like that. And this is sort of the beginning of this eclecticism or this manifestation, if you will, that um, I'm going to get into in a moment. Um, but let me show you where the real headache starts. After talking to all these uh, musicians, let's see if I can use good, in, in Vienna and, and elsewhere, um, OK, can you see this? Ah, sorry. A very sensitive mouse. There we go. I'm not going to scroll then. You get the idea. Can you see that? You can see this, right? So I took all the musicians that I spoke with or saw perform in the last 40 years and, 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 and started just, just putting them into bins, if you will. In, 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 in German, there is a, a great term called Schublade, which means shoe drawer. And, and so it, it, these are their drawers. <laughs> and these seven groups range from from what's just purely traditional U.S. performance. Even though there is this breaking away of, of, from the U.S. model, there are still many musicians in Vienna and around Austria that, that play just like U.S. American musicians. Then there's something that I call post-tradition. This is music that sounds like <clears throat> jazz, but a U.S. American musician would not play that way. You know, you see jazz or instrumentation, upright bass, piano, things like that. But, you know, downbeat or jazz times would have a major problem with it or call it, who isn't that interesting? It would not be in the tradition. Then we have a huge strand of music that is based in DJ and hip hop, which is very strange. It, 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 and it, I, this word strange is problematic for me because it's normal over there. <laughs> but I had to actually split the two eyes in my head apart or my two ears apart and, 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 or leave my US American eyes and ears at home and try to embed myself into this sort of idea of eclecticism that is very disorienting. This DJ and hip hop um, strand, if you will, is hip hop on one hand using things from hip hop, but also DJs using things like dance music and techno and stuff like that. M very processed uh, music. Then we have the folk ethnic. Now when I say folk music in this, this country, you think of things like Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell. And, but here, folk is really sort of the people's music. And, and country is a bad example. Someone like Woody Guthrie or before in this country. People who are, who are not only rooting their music in Austria's tradition, but also an idea of ethnic music, which is music outside of Austria. Like, there's a lot of activity and interest in Eastern European music, the Balkans. Then we have this column, cabaret. There's a huge cabaret tradition in Vienna. Uh, there's a, f a phrase a lot of people say is uh, Wien ist ein Theater Theaterstadt. Vienna is a theater city. The Austrians have a wonderful, wonderful tradition of sitting down and, and chatting and smoking and drinking. And, and they like to have something to smoke and chat and drink about. And the cabaret is, 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 is also a form of social commentary, and there is a strand of music that capitalizes on this. Then I had this strand that I didn't know where to put it in any of those previous five categories. I just called it unclassified music. And I think that is the strongest music uh, that has been put together. More on that in a moment. And then finally, abroad. These are people who left Austria, like Joe Zavinal, or um, make their living elsewhere. Music, Austrian musicians who live here in New York. So the reason I'm showing this to you, and I, I don't know if you can see it on this screen, is some of the names are bold and some are not. Can you see that? Okay. 
and I'm not going to scroll because you saw what, ha I did, what happened last time when I tried to do that. But underneath here it says, the musicians whose, whose names are bold are in multiple categories. So if you find one, like see how Oskar Eichinger is in both categories? And someone like Friedrich Gulde is in almost all of them. Gulde, 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 Gulde. What do I do with these people? You know, and, and, and they swim in and out of these strands of the music very, very easily. The way music works, at least in this town, is if I, for, for me, for example, I identify strongly with the downtown scene, free music, experimental, John Zorn, stuff like that. I would not shop myself as a swing musician, though I can play the music, it's just not my tradition. I would not shop myself as a Brazilian jazz musician, even though if I got called to do the gig, I'd figure out how to do it and I could do it and, and, and make it happen. These musicians flow, fle flow freely across these columns and actually enjoy doing so. And so you get this sort of jack of all trades Master of almost none, a sum to be nice, thank you. And someone like Friedrich Gulde, who is an immensely accomplished musician, I'm not here to knock his musicianship. Um, and, and all these musicians are, most of them, 90% of them are incredibly well-trained musicians. But their goals, their pursuits are to sort of, like I said with these ideas, you know, I, I do a little of this, I do a little of that, I pull it together, da da da, which is very frustrating and almost seems how can I say it nicely? This sort of do what you want attitude, which to a, a New Yorker feels, wait, you're not playing this game correctly. <laughs> and because they do not have to fight for their music making in the same way US Americans do, my friends do, <laughs> you know, you hear all, all these great jazz musicians that die in poverty, they, can, they have this liberty and this freedom to do something that, 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 that is hard to imagine to do. Someone like Wynton Marcellus or John Zorn who do multiple things, they're, they're firmly rooted, but that's the exception rather than the norm. So that's kind of thing one I wanted to show you. And then, let me try thing two. Hopefully this will work, it won't jump, jump, jump. Okay, these are the gravitational centers, if you will. Oh. Try it again. Ah, okay. I'm not. I just. It, but it's okay. I, I, I love the, the the instant support. Thank you. See, I don't want that. Anyway, trust me. You only need the top half. So you get this idea of these seven strands of music making, and then to further try to talk about this music, I tried to put it into gravitational centers, where do these musicians belong and what are the engines of, of, of the creation of this music. And there are four, four engines, well now there are only three because the Vienna Art Orchestra is no longer. But these are all engines that, are, are, that have existed or have been created in the last 10 years, 15 years. And notice that one is a post-tradition, the Vienna Art Orchestra, which you'll hear in a moment. Unclassified is this just what is it sort of idea then this sort of overlap of post-tradition, very traditional, and then so the Celeste Jam Sessions. I should go back. This is, this is an ensemble. This is a community of musicians. This is another community of musicians, and this is a jam session that I attended frequently um, over the years. And trying to pull these people together into who they're associated with so they're not associated really, even though you could label these things as styles or genres or I don't even, they don't think that way. It was very hard for me to take my rubrics and try to apply it to jazz and improvised music in Vienna, but this is the best I could do. And I'm hopefully conveying to you this idea of tons of information and, 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 and it's very slippery what do I do with all of this? Because you, if, you, if I gave you 100 jazz musicians, US jazz musicians, you could easily sort them. Swing, bebop, free, Latin, all these sort of things. Very easily we would not have a problem. But again, these people slip, for, and, and you have, even though these are, these are gravitational cent centers, you have some people who can work in two or three gravitational centers. 
So, um, gosh, time does fly when you're having fun. Um, so just a, co a couple of things um, to, to give to you. This idea of classification and, and uh, gravitational centers are all my concepts, right? These are all things that I am bringing into the jazz and improvised music scene. They're not saying, I am a post-traditional musician. I am an unclassified. These are, this is the labeler labeling, not the labeled labeling. So that was sort of just to get a handle on it so you could look at a book and, 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 and try to get a picture of what's going on there. Um, but I really want to sort of give you this idea of, of, of what I found in addition to just grouping people or, or the, 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 uh, the challenge of, of trying to stitch this all together. Another thing about the scene in general is that it is almost devoid, it's almost absent of any racial construct. And we can talk about Austrian identity. You, that you can say that racism exists in Austria, but it's not really race. It's things like language, nationality, religion. Um, and, and even though racism is coming to Europe, it's, it, it just, it's, it's a very new concept. In fact, uh, Herr Wagenleitner, who was one of my, um, who, uh, he teaches at the University of, of Salzburg, and he was on my committee for my dissertation, said, the concept of race is alien to the Austrian that his students do not get an idea of race. And he has to explain to his students in Salzburg what race is. And it's, when, when you think of jazz, and, and, and I often say you cannot understand the 20th century and race and jazz without understanding all three. They're so interwoven. And this idea of, of, of the African American experience and, and, and storytelling and, 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 and identity creation and all that, that is just so fused into what jazz is, to be in a space where, where, where there is just no idea of race. Why are you playing this music? What, what story are you telling? What are you doing? And it seems like, more like this buffet, I'm gonna take these things and I'm gonna use them. I don't know why they were generated. And they would be the first to say yes. Jazz is out of the African American experience. Jazz is a black music, they would all say, but it would go to this beyond space very quickly. And so this was very, very fr frustrating to me until I had someone uh, explain this to me. Because living in this country and, and, and growing up listening to this music and all this sort of stuff, you just, and it's all through the jazz scholarship, race, 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 race. And even if you talk about beyond race, that we live in a post-race world now with, with our first African-American president, which is not true, but you know what I'm saying. This idea of, of before and after race, race is still there, right? And so to discuss jazz without race was very difficult to me. Um, and I, I, for example, let me show you a picture. Okay, do you all know who that is? is that Elvis That's Elvis Presley. <laughs> okay, this is a record called Chocolate Elvis by a uh, band named Tosca. And uh, this is the front cover and this is the back cover. And when I first saw this, and if you know anything about Elvis, you can't really talk about Elvis without race either. Because uh, his producer um, said, if I could just find a white musician who sounds black, I'd make a whole lot of money. And he did. Um, to me, this looked like a, a sort of a racialized something. And so I see, you know, ch records called Chocolate Elvis, and here you have made out of chocolate Elvis, here, here dark chocolate and here white chocolate. And, and, and you know, what's going on here? And, and I w was able to email <laughs> one of the guys in, in, um, in uh, Tosca and he gave me an answer which really further sort of pushed my ideas of, of um, what race is and is not in, in Austria. And this is not going to be nearly as long as the last one, I promise you. I just, I want to get these people's voices in here. I want you to hear other people talking about this stuff. Um, and this is what he said about Chocolate Elvis, which was released in 1999. Chocolate, Chocolate Elvis was a combination of two artistic topics that were important to me in 1993 and 94. First, after some years of a pause, I started to work together with my old music friend from school days. 
Richard Dorfmeister. We enjoyed that a lot and produced three instrumental tracks over a year. Second, I was in radio and sound art a lot and a big fan of Bill Fontana. So I spend a lot of time going around in cities and recording with my ear microphones onto DAT tape. Ear microphones are these microphones that you actually wear on your ears so you get an exact recording of what it feels like to be there. Um, another important experiment brought uh, the, the, those two strings together. I went to New York City for the first time in my life in 1993, and after having built up an archive of sounds of Vienna, Berlin, Rome, Paris, I was enthusiastic about recording as much as possible of the New York I was walking in for the first time. Having always been a fan of found footage and voices, I also recorded the people I talked to with their allowance. One afternoon in downtown Manhattan, if I had a map I could locate it, I ran into a street singer who called himself Chocolate Elvis, quote, because he was not white, he was chocolate, unquote. He was a very friendly person and we began talking. He offered to sing into my microphone for $20. I accepted the offer, paid, and got 20 minutes of his street performance on DAT tape. Back in Vienna later that fall, I had a session with Richard where I implemented a lot of my recordings in our mixes. On the same tape, there was the Chocolate Elvis performance. I tried around and edited some elements with the sampler, especially the da da di da da di di. This is the Chocolate Elvis singing. I liked as as they were fitting rhythmically to the beat and sounded very dadaistic. I always loved dadaistic lyrics. We liked it, thought it was groovy, and made 500 vinyl EPs. They were sold out within a week. I still have one. <laughs> so Chocolate Elvis is more a story about Aubier Trouvé. Bill Fontana field recordings, Richard's first Akai S1000 sampler, and my first trip to New York, and about nonsense lyrics, and one fact, that New Yorkers are generally more rhythmic or tight, groovy talking and playing music species than Viennese. So it is a collage about groove somehow. The race topic never played any role, neither did Elvis. I only learned to like Elvis last year through my five-year-old Con uh, son Conrad, who loves Elvis. Maybe it is homage on Vienna and New York. So I just try to bring things like this, and I've, I've got a couple other things that I want to share with you, to sort of show that over time when I was doing my research, and this happens in anthropology, you start learning about your own cultural biases. And, and they, like, well, the scene music without these very important variables in Austria it was made me begin to see and hear this music as someone who lived there and who, who didn't have these sort of dynamics that we have here in the U.S. So, you know, you only look, I'm fond of saying it in students, I'm sorry if you heard it already once this semester, the fish is the last one to hear about the water, right? You take away the water, the fish, <laughs> but if you don't take the water away, the fish just sort of swims around happily. So this, I, I didn't realize how, how, how important or how just, just thoroughly soaked jazz scholarship was with race until it just kept coming up again and again and again uh, that it wasn't there. So to see the invisible, to hear the silences is really the challenge of an ethnomusicologist or any anthropologist. So let's talk about silence. <laughs> um, what, the reason I talked about race so much is because in, in scholarship, you've heard, probably heard of Henry Louis Gates' idea of signification, uh, the signifying monkey, this idea of going backwards in time and reclaiming things. I see some heads nodding. What I thought, because of all my studies in African-American literature, et cetera, et cetera, what was initially signifying is something I'm calling cultural layering. And you see it all the time in Austria. In fact, uh, back to the racial thing, someone, I, I pointed out to someone graffiti that said, fight racism. And I said, you said race doesn't, doesn't exist in Austria. And he said, yeah, that's absurd because someone, someone just wrote that because they saw it in a movie. That's why it's in English. You don't see fight race, racism in Austria. I mean, and I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't have time to go down the road of the similarities between racism and fascism. Uh, fascism is a very different thing. I'm specifically talking about race. Um, so, back to the signifying monkey. If, if we look at certain things, and I'm glad I have an art historian in the room because she can help me. If I look at this, I'm sorry it's a little pixelated. This is the first record by the Vienna Art Orchestra. 
Now, you may not be able to read, read this because you're not a Frank Zappa fan, or do we have some Frank Zappa fans in here that can read this? Okay, do you see, what, see what's on this record? These are what? These two white things. People who lived in the 20th century, you know that they're Polaroids, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what kind of blew my mind is that's the Frank Zappa co cover of Studio Tan. And they just use it at, at, at ra not random, it's not random, but it's also not, it's not coded. And when you talk to Austrians about it, they, they, they shrug. They, oh yeah, I like Frank Zappa, I just put it there. Here's my favorite all-time example of cultural layering. Um, I don't want to get this wrong. Okay, many of you will recognize this album cover by Simon and Garfunkel, Book Ends, right? From 1968. Okay. This is a band, these are two musicians, Kuda and Dorfmeister, Dorfmeister I referred to earlier. Uh, and I, I asked one of them, you know, did it mean anything? No, they're just, we like the cover. So, and you just see this again and again, and uh, yeah. So, a couple other sort of conce concepts that I ran into or observations. There is no, ma uh, how should I say this? Austrian musicians, when they go to school, they'll play U.S. American tunes, covers, and things like that. But as soon as they pr become professional, they stop playing standards. It's seen as, if you're a student, you play standards. When you go professional, you don't play them anymore. When in ju it's just the other way around here. Like If you're a professional, you can play the heck out of a standard in New York City. And the, the, the better you play a ballad, the better a musician you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's such an emphasis on new composition in Austria. This is partly due to these grants, money to create, cre create new works. But it's just seen as a sort of an idea of, I, I've done that. I did that in the school. That's, that's something I don't do anymore. And I spoke a little bit uh, in, in one of my quotes about how there's really no driving rhythm in the music. And I'll play some examples in, in a minute. So, I have six musical examples that I'd like to play for you, and they come from three streams. I have three examples that I'm going to play for you from the 80s and, and then again in the 2000s. And I want you, I, we don't have enough time to listen to everything, and that's the problem when, when we talk about music. It takes time to listen, it takes time. It's a time based activity. You know, that's why I'm so envious of art. I can show you multiple images very quickly, and you can go back and look at them and, and digest them, but music you have to listen to through the through the duration, and I'm only going to be able to give you a taste. So I'm going to play, I've talked about the Vienna Art Orchestra several times, so I'm going to play an example. This is from uh, their record, from no, from no Time to Ragtime. But before I play the Vienna Art Orchestra piece, I want to play you the piece it's based off of. Um, Ornette Coleman, saxophonist, wrote a piece called Silence, in the 60s, and I just want to get you to get a little bit of it in your ear. Hopefully I have enough. Thank you for enduring the technical stuff. People think the piece is over, it's not. <laughs> and it's your typical head, solos, head construction of a jazz tune. Okay, so that's the Ornette original, and I'm sorry we don't have time to listen to all of it. And I'm going to quit apologizing for not being able to listen to everything, because we'd just be here all day, and, and we've got stuff to do. So. Um, this, is, this album, From No Time to Ragtime, is all based on 
other composers. And even though I said that this is idea of new composition, these are all variations about fill in the blank. Um, and I, I'm going to play you this, this tune, uh, variations about silence. And I want you to try to remember what you just heard and see what is kept and what is, what is not. That we heard, right? You can already feel a completely different mood, and I'm just going to talk over it a little bit. And it's a much larger ensemble. It's not just a small jazz quartet. And Matthias Ruig, who is the leader of the Vienna Art Orchestra, talked about this idea of historic resonance, this idea of using something from the past and going beyond it. Yeah, there's still stuff going on. Just, you, if you heard this, you don't think Ornette Coleman, you don't think jazz, you think chamber music. You get the idea, and it's a long 14-minute performance. And um, but the idea that that taking a piece from the past, using it in what you're doing, even if it's just a fragment, and this incredible liberty to just go on and do whatever you want. Uh, another example: Franz Kohlermann, trumpet player, also a composer, large ensembles, has a piece. Um, that is based on an E.E. E. Cummings poem. A uh, piece is entitled, The Moon is Hiding in Her Hair. And I'm just going to let it run. And he was interested in this idea of a post-avant-garde. You know, you think of avant-garde as at the edge, right? And then something beyond the edge. And so he, instead of using, say, Ornette Coleman, very jazz element, Goes with a poet, E.E. E. Cummings. He read the poem to himself, sort of developed melodies out of the poem. And, and the only real jazz marker is he sticks to mostly jazz instrumentation. Sounds a lot like cool Miles Davis. Third stream, the, the fusion of jazz and classical music is, is very popular in Austria for obvious reasons. Okay, so, so that was the idea of a post avant garde. Now, here's another piece of music. When I started hearing stuff like this, is when I really, really got frustrated and, and confused. Uh, this is a band called Call Boys Incorporated. <laughs> and they. This is all improvised. And then during one of my interviews, I, I said just casually, jazz is a problem. And, and it was an interview I did with three people at, at, at dinner, and I tape recorded it. And I, and I can go back and listen to the reaction. When I said, jazz is a problem, they all howled saying, yes, it's a huge problem. And there's this whole strain of, of jazz and improvised music that problematized jazz, what jazz is and isn't. And this would be in that unclassified strand that I showed you.
so there's not, it's non-referential, right? There's no Ornette Coleman fragment. There's no E.E. E. Cummings poem. So you get the idea. Okay, so these are all recordings from the 80s. And I want to show you parallels in the last 10 years. The first is this idea of historic residence. This is the album cover by Clemens Selesny's Electric Band. And it sounds something like this, just to get, get it in your ears. I know I'm racing through this stuff, but you've been awfully patient, so I just want to listen to some music. Let's get to a better example. Now, basically rock instrumentation. This is a picture of the band, right? Keys, saxophone, trumpet, synthesizer, bass, drums. But this idea of cultural layering, this idea of historic resonance, look at the cover of this Miles Davis record. It's, same, it's, <laughs> it's crazy, right? So, ah, so again, Clemens' record, Miles' record. And if we listen to Miles' music from that record, can we hear any similarities except the instrumentation? They're both live recordings. Miles' version is decidedly more funky. This is, this is party music. Especially when you get into it. And you, this is this driving rhythm that is just absent in Austrian jazz and improvised music. I see people, people bopping their heads and hands. A couple of more uh, observations. I told you earlier about the post avant garde. Here's a more recent post avant garde performance called Gomberg by a trumpet player named Fra uh, Franz Hautzinger. And he uses just trumpet. Oh, no, that wasn't it. And he has a whole backstory about this character named Gomberg. This guy, he, this otherworldly being that emits this sound and could read you this whole poem. It's rather psychedelic. This is a good example of post tradition, somewhere between post tradition and unclassified. It leads towards unclassified, but.
In fact, the name of my dissertation is Free from Jazz, and he's the one who coined the term that he wanted to get away from jazz. And then towards the end, oh, get this, towards the end of my research, he sent me this email. He said, I'm a jazz musician. <laughs> And it was just, you know, and then I realized that, okay, if you're free from jazz, not only does it mean you can run away from jazz, you can run back to it if you're totally free. But this sort of typifies this idea of, of I am either a jazz musician or I'm not, but no, the Austrians can go back and forth. Okay, another little music before I conclude. This is called Control. It's spelled C-T-R-L, just like the button on your computer. And the name of the record is 1125, the date they recorded it. And this is more music in the sort of, how should I say, jazz as problem, improvised music as problem tradition. I saw this band perform, and I have to say it was one of the best things I witnessed. And they used teeny, what are called tiny instruments, like toy pianos and found objects and kitchen utensils. These are students who either went to jazz conservatory, maybe went, you know, are audio engineers. And this is what they like to do with sound. In many ways, I think this is some of the strongest music I heard because the interaction, it's very interesting to watch. And I think Austrians have very good listening capabilities. But I don't think anyone would call this jazz. So that's that sort of gooey center between jazz and improvised music where all this stuff lives. All right. To conclude, what were I, if I were to continue this research, what would I do with it? Well, you saw those columns with the seven sort of classifications of the music and the gravitational centers. On an airplane home from one of my trips, I had this vision of, of seeing bubbles that connected each other dynamically. And that was the only way I could sort of communicate how these different groups worked with each other. And I, I sort of looked at different computer modeling options and have yet to find something that could do it and would have to design this thing I see in my head, like this musician is connected to this musician. And then you got little dials that you could, okay, they, they did stuff in the 70s, but not in the 80s and stuff like that. And then you could play with it and quickly learn who did what with whom. And this is really the only way to pierce this idea of rampant eclecticism. The other thing that I'd really like to do, if I were to go further with this, is talk to the audience more. I had a chance to talk to one audience member, and he was incredibly informative. The way this music is digested would be very interesting. What are they hearing? What are they paying for? Why do they keep coming back? So much of scholarship in music is, is, is generation side. This is how I put the music together. This is why it sounds like what it sounds like. I think a consumption model or a reception model would be very interesting because Austrians are avid concert goers. The, the, there are multiple halls and multiple clubs full of, of concert goers every night of the week. And then the third thing I would do, because you've got to be a good academic and do things in threes, um, is talk to non-jazz musicians, people who are classical musicians. Talk to non-Austrians, people who are from other countries that live in Austria, and ask for their definitions of jazz. I asked a bunch of Austrians what they thought jazz was. I'd be very curious to talk to the non-Austrians to see, you know, they see it culturally from a distance. Um, the ones who are working there, the ones who are living there and playing with other musicians. But I hope I've conveyed to you the sort of chaos, <laughs> the, the multi-layers, the lack of consistency. Um, the, there were, I, I ended up talking about more of, uh, of what wasn't there than was there, and that was really difficult as an academic to sort of write about silence and, and absence and invisible things. But as, as a New Yorker, and I consider myself a New Yorker, what I was listening for, I had to stop listening for that and begin to hear what was actually there and not hear what was not there. And 
that's part of the problem. That's why this scene is underdocumented because it is too eclectic and is too fluid. It sounds exciting. It is exciting. It's a lot of fun. And I think, and I, I could talk long about the idea of the Austrian who likes to sit in the club and sit there for hours. And, and, and Austrians like to listen to bad music because it gives them something to talk about. I don't, I don't think New Yorkers want to listen to bad music because it's too expensive. And, but, but the Viennese and the Austrians in general love to, to, to argue. So I hope you've, you've enjoyed this little journey this afternoon. Um, we have time for questions, and I, and I see yummy things over there. But um, uh, I, would I would love to hear your questions. Lloyd. I really like the presentation. Well, oh, thank you. Enjoy it like uh, fully. So, um, of course, according to your interviews with, let's say, all the Austrian musicians and non musicians thereof, or whatever like that, um, let's say back to the Americas, why do, let's say, Americans, and, like in particular musicians, like have this obsession with trying to like, car like compartmentalize and define jazz like so much? I think it comes back to the construction of. U.S. American identity, and I use that term U.S. American very careful because I'm not talking about South America or Central America. I'm not talking about Canada. And having been in Canada recently, man, it feels like Europe. I mean, they have, <laughs> it just, it, with all those beautiful buildings, I was in Guelph, and they just have some great architecture, but it's been a beautiful building and then a 7-Eleven. It's very strange. <laughs> um, not that we don't have beautiful buildings, buildings in New York, but, um, but I think that the negotiation of U.S. American identity of, of who you are. We're all Americans, right? We've got this huge melting pot. I'm not comfortable with the term. I prefer the idea of, the we've talked about this, the tossed salad where we're mixed together and we leak on each other, but I'm still a tomato and you're still a cucumber and things like that. <laughs> um, and these are the things I think long and hard about. You know, in, in Europe, they have the benefits of nationality. They have the benefits of, of, of history. This country's history is, is, is a violent one and um, who we are as Americans, I don't know if you can say that in 2000, 2013. You know, I, I don't, you know, American jazz, I, you know, and I got into arguments with people in Guelph about, well, that's a New York thing, Tom. We don't do that on the, on the left coast. You know, we just don't. And so there's, there's a regionalism and then a sort of, a, I think, a creation of identity that, that, that needs to maintain, be, be maintained. And I think through jazz, people, Jazz is such a beautiful thing. It was, it was a globalization phenomenon before we had the term globalization. It was postmodern before postmodernity. In many ways, if you know your jazz, you can actually tell the future. I know it's weird I'm saying that out loud, but the idea of things happen in jazz before they happen in other places. These ideas of having these improvised con uh, conversations. And another thing that I have in mind, um, of course, all of this Mm -hmm. that the we used to watch in the uh, called History Jazz. Um, now, what a musician like uh, Cecil, how do, how do musicians like, you know, in U.S. American music, you know, quote unquote, mm -hmm. like Cecil Taylor, be treated in Austria? They would be loved. But because they were a non-Austrian. Loved as a foreigner. And this is the thing that happens is when, when a U.S. American jazz musician goes to Vienna, they're seen as an American first and a jazz musician second. It's not this gooey jazz project thing. The Austrians don't see themselves that way and they don't see jazz that way. When I make music with my friends or when I go see some of this great music, I see this negotiation of space and identity. I know I'm saying this very quickly. And, no. and Lloyd understands because we've talked about the system, stuff in the history of jazz. And, like, I just, and like this, what confuses me is like why like, in, like, say, in the U.S. American jazz definition would the, like, let's say Cecil be treated as It's a very good question. Yeah. Um, those of you who don't know, Cecil T Taylor is a piano player, plays very loud, chaotic music, and I, I've gotten to see him a couple of times, and he's wonderful. Because he doesn't fit in this, this sort of mode of jazz. He's not a bebop musician, he's not a swing musician, he's this, this adventurous musician. And that, if you know your history of, of, of jazz, Starting in the 50s, there were a bunch of Amer African-American musicians like Ornette, like Cecil, that wanted to create a music that could not be copied. And so if, if you don't think about that, what is Cecil Taylor anymore? 
So what is Cecil Taylor in Austria? They love him there. They love the music. It's energetic. But when I think of Cecil, like when I saw him perform at Lincoln Center and people left in droves, there is, there's a tension here that's not there. So this is sort of the baggage that, that, that I took over to the Austrian part of the world as when I see a Cecil Taylor, or I saw Peter Brutzman, uh, who when he plays here, loud saxophone player, people, it takes a certain kind of person to enjoy his music. I saw him on Easter Sunday at Porgy and Bess, and the place was packed, and they loved it. There's, that's why I want to talk to the consumers of this music. What are they hearing? Because they're obviously hearing something different than I, than I am with these New York ears. Um, yeah, it's a lot, it's a big pill to swallow. It's about like the ears of the culture. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about who's listening, what's, but not, not who's playing. And that's, that shifts the paradigm. Over, Tim. Can't you consider that because the standard is starting to exist, mm -hmm. that but the expectation is that New Yorkers or those of us in North America, you're sort of trained to be like a particular composer. I mean, that's, that's generally music. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible that we're irritated by bad jazz, which is good jazz because it's improvised, mm -hmm. because we're under this umbrella that jazz is a set of certain standards, and that's how we're raised with the, the Austrian art? Yeah, I think you're right. It's not that they don't have a good ear. It's not that they don't know what they're listening to, but they have such a wide, they have, they have such a voracious appetite, and I think we do not. Even though when you talk to jazz fans, most jazz fans have a wide range of interests. But they have, I mean, but not all jazz fans like electronic music on top of what they, you know, these Austrians love so much of so many different things. And it's confusing at first, but then when you just be zen, if you're just zen about it, <laughs> they like what they like and they like it like that. And they don't, you're right, they do not have this rigorous training of, okay, I gotta shed my standards and do this. I had some Austrians admit, I didn't spend much time with Charlie Parker. And to admit that as a US American would be like, oh, you haven't done your homework. And they have that liberty and it's a social, social it's accepted socially there. Yes? Yeah, well, where to start, I mean. Uh, but I uh, heard you talk about, I, I definitely see your particular coming up here in, in New York versus myself being from Europe and having moved to New York later. So I, I see your your lens your lenses uh, <laughs> in, in your talk, uh, but but it's a it's a very rich talk and uh, thank you very much for it. I, I like the uh, questions that um, Yaman asked here um, as well as the uh, and it's so, so, sort of echoed in my mind as well as, as I was listening to you. I want to I don't have a good question really, so maybe I'll throw two questions. At okay. You, I mean. um, uh, one triggered my interest at the beginning of the talk. We talked about the emancipation of jazz in Europe in the 1920s to 1950s. And I, I found curious that characterization because later on he came back to it, talking about the socioeconomic, mm -hmm. uh, meaning the payment um, aspect of it, and, and then the, the social um, uh, the racism, where strong factors why um, many jazz musicians found it much bigger welcome going to Europe, even in the 1920s to 1950s. Well, oh, Sidney Bechet um, moved there, for, right, for example. Right. Um, uh, they just earned their money there, but they, all, they also were appreciated mm -hmm. in a deeper and, and greater way than they were back home. Um, and so uh, I found the, the, the phrase emancipation um, of jazz in, 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 in Europe a little curious in that regard, because I always understood it that way perception of jazz music, music in Europe was a much more open one, and that's not to argue that there's no racism in Europe, no. um, but it was a much open one, even historically speaking, and even if we leave out uh, nowadays um, jazz scenes in, in Europe. Um, but I also want to uh, move on and, and talk about the same um, tension that you, know, that, that you spoke about, jazz versus modern music. I also think of jazz as, as a spectrum, really. You know, you have free jazz. Mm -hmm. What about that? Cecil Taylor was just mentioned. Um, so my question 
have, and I want to throw some names at you too. Uh, people like Don Cherry, mm -hmm. Shakti, John McLaughlin, mm -hmm. Miles in India, uh, you, you mentioned um, Amer Amer uh, the Ensemble of Chicago, Anthony Braxton, mm -hmm. Klaus Doldinger. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, wh where do we put those, you know? And, and is there perhaps a, a sign of, is there greater avant-gardism going on in Europe um, and Austria? Then have, a, 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 and then vice versa, perhaps a more traditionalism Back home in the United States. Is that a fair characterization? I'm not sure. Okay. No, I know. See, these are these sort of gooey conversations we have around this music. And I've talked to other scholars of European music, European jazz specifically, and it's okay, a bunch of things. One, we're, there's jazz in Europe as far as like the bed of musicians who are playing quote unquote jazz in Europe is one thing. US Americans like Sidney Bechet or Art Ensemble of Chicago coming to Europe as foreigners, in my mind, is a very different thing. And I would, even though they're both called jazz, you know, it's like sediments almost. It's like you have the people who are living in those countries making the music, and then you have people who come and visit. And, and how much cross-pollination is there between these two poll pollinations? Uh, sorry, populations, excuse me. How much cross-pollination are there? That's hard to say. Um, interestingly, at Porgy and Best, which is arguably one of the best jazz clubs in the world, and it's not that big. They have something like, it's only like 200 bucks or 300 bucks. You as a student can buy a, a, a yearly pass, and if there are chances for you, if a, the club is not sold out, you can go in any night. You know, could you imagine that in this country? You spend 200 bucks, and, and, and if you're a student of this music and you like this music, and you could go into this one club almost every night. So some of the younger musicians had seen all these greats, like Braxton, like Rotsman, and stuff like that. And, and I was very impressed at how well they knew, quote unquote, my music, the music over here. Now, how much did that influence what they were doing? The quick answer is not much. They liked being near that music. They appreciated it. They respected it. Non-musicians loved it. But it, it, it just seems like this barrier, this sort of no, no person's land between the two that they don't really cross. When I go see someone like Cecil Taylor here, I feel like I'm communing with something that this is part of my music, this is what I want. To do. And there was also this idea of jazz tourism that kept coming up in my research, that musicians from Austria would go to the US just to say they have been there and would come back. And I think if we think of these visiting greats who were loved and appreciated as sort of a Oh, look at that. Isn't that nice? They may not feel a connection, that there is this transatlantic connection. It, it's, it's so nebulous. It's so ethereal. It's so not there. It, the, the musics are very close, but they're almost two different projects. I hope I'm beginning to answer your question. What may sound like avant-gardeism to our ears when we listen to some of this music and that's generated is not necessarily avant-garde to them. I don't think they are trying to say, I am different. When Cecil Taylor sits down at a piano, he is talking about a very, quote unquote, different experience. I think the social project that is jazz in this corner of the world doesn't happen in Austria. And that's not to say it doesn't happen in other countries. Under communism, for example, there were a lot of musicians who were opposing their regimes. And, and I get into this in my dissertation, taking the US taking the nationality, taking the stuff out of the music that they're doing. The Austrians didn't need to go through this social process because they were socially supported, I think. And, and, and if, if you compare the Austrian jazz scene with the German jazz, specifically the Eastern German jazz scene, there's just this push, there isn't this push against a regime or any oppression because they were supported. So they're in this little happy bubble underneath that looks up but doesn't go there. Did they begin to answer some of this stuff? Yes. Um, yeah, it seems that the, the underlying question you're, you're getting at is what does it mean to belong to a tradition uh, or not to belong to a tradition or to mix traditions? Or to uh, push against a tradition, yeah. And, 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 uh, or not have to push against a tradition. That, that uh, you know, that although there, uh, it, it, I mean, it seems that one of the things that, that sort of uh, was flummoxing you was that although they're in uh, uh, Vienna, they don't have this Freudian need to kill the father. 
uh, you know, they, 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 they don't have this anxiety uh, about it, and they just, they, and they just, they, they're not so worried about, uh, you know, where are the, where are the roots of this mm -hmm. coming from? They, 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 that, that just is not an interesting question for them in, in, in some, in some way. Uh, and I found myself wondering if, if someone who was, uh, you know, coming at this from, you know, say that they were a, a scholar of, um, uh, classical music, uh, if they were in, uh, you know, if they say, "Well, I know all, I know all about Schoenberg, or I know all about uh, Stockhausen," and I and I found myself really uh, sort of uh, puzzled by this as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess uh, you know, what, what what do you think is the? Uh, I mean, if you if you ask them, what does tradition mean to them? What would they say? Oh gosh, how much time you got? Um, uh, ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> um, there is tradition in Austria. It's it, it's it's you know the, there is Viennese dialect. There's Viennese food. There's Viennese practices. I mean it's an old old quote unquote old city, uh, relatively speaking. Um, what is tradition in that town? I mean it's like saying what is tradition in this town. Because you brought up Schoenberg, Schoenberg and the whole Second Viennese School, that was that was a conscious decision to push back at something, right? It's not that the, the social need isn't there or the project isn't there. There's an example of it. Freud is another because you invoke Freud. His his ideas are, are push against something. In this jazz space, which in my mind is all about pushing back, all about recreating or reconstituting ideas, and it's interesting to me. When a band really cooks, when it's really grooving, and I say this as a bass player, it's really rhythmical, and people move in their seats. It's interesting to me that the music in Austria, 99 times out of 100, it's not grooving. It, it's very slippery, it's very, it's, it doesn't swing, it doesn't burn, it doesn't tip. And I talk about this at length, that, that it, it, it was very frustrating for me as a bass player to try to lock up with drummers because they weren't really interested in playing Pulse. And, and at this conference I was just at, there were two drummers, uh, Hamid Drake from, from, from Chicago and a drummer at, uh, from Korea, and they did a duet, and they were talking about it afterwards. And the Korean drummer said about Hamid's playing is when he hits a drum, energy goes through the drum and into the earth. And they got into this long conversation about bringing ideas down, you know, subverting power, going against hegemony and things like that. If you don't need to do that, it's going to affect the sound. It's not going to groove. It's not going to burn. It's going to be pretty. It's going to be cool. And it's going to be diverse. And it's in this space where things can float around. It doesn't have to get grounded. And for, for me, as a bass player who loves to burn and loves to groove, and anyone who's played with me knows what I'm talking about, 